Christ is risen. He is risen Would you please stand for our call to worship? Happy Easter, everyone. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, 
do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples.
Would you please stand?
Welcome to church today. My name is Cam. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to say happy Resurrection Sunday to all those who are here in person and to those who are joining us online. Today, we celebrate the most incredible moment in world history. That is, if you believe it. And there are some who I think are here today who maybe do not. I'm certain that we have a wide variety of people here today. There are some here today who are all in, right? You know who you are. Whatever I say, whatever we sing, whatever the text tells us, you will nod along, you will shout amen or whisper it in your heads in this place, and you'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. You believe, you know Christ, and you are here to celebrate Then there are some here today who are curious. Maybe you've just started coming to church. Perhaps someone from that first group invited you to join them. Or maybe you've been attending for a while and you're still trying to figure out what this Jesus guy has to do with you and your life. And finally, there are some here who are skeptical. You're here not because you buy it or because you're curious to learn. You're here because you were dragged here by someone under the strict conditions that your attendance at the Easter service is a prerequisite for your participation in the Easter meal to follow. I know that you're out there. If you can just make it through about 40 more minutes, you'll be stuffing your face with turkey and ham and mashed potatoes before you know it, and you can hang up your church-going shoes until December 24th. I get that. And actually, friends, I think this is pretty awesome. We have all sorts of people from all sorts of different places with all sorts of stories and backgrounds from these extremes and everything in between sharing the same experience this morning. And no matter what we believe about its legitimacy or its truthfulness, the reality is that we have all been brought together by the story of a man who lived 2,000 years ago whose death and burial didn't quite follow the normal pattern of things. Well, today, my hope is that all of us, no matter where we are at, would open our minds and open our hearts as we explore this story that brings us together, as we ask ourselves, what are we to make of the empty tomb? So as we begin, I want us to pray and ask God if he's there to speak to us and show us each something this morning. Would you pray with me? God, We pray that you would speak 
God, I pray that you would nudge us, that you would teach us something. God, we pray that, that, you wouldn't, that, 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 that we wouldn't just experience uh, what I have to say, but we would experience what you have to say to each and every one of us. Speak this morning to us. Amen. Now, uh, most often on Easter Sunday, we do a special service that is pretty distinct from our normal Sundays, where we have unique elements, and and the message is kind of a one-off, stand-alone message that forces us to hit pause on what we've been doing on Sundays leading up to Easter. But this year, things are a little bit different. You see, for the past 17 months or so, we have found ourselves as a congregation studying a book in the Bible called the Gospel of Mark, which is a biography of sorts of Jesus Christ as written and told by one of Jesus' closest earthly friends, the Apostle Peter, who writes to tell us that Jesus is no mere man, but he is the Messiah, the very Son of God. And over these past 17 months, we have read about Jesus' life and ministry, what he taught people, how he healed people, performed miracles, and and how he modeled a way of life that was completely countercultural and would be countercultural in any culture, one that, that emphasized faith over skepticism, peace over violence. Love over hatred, commonality over political divide, equality over disparity, and eternal mindedness over short sightedness, just to name a few. And over the past few months, we have witnessed Jesus himself model this alternative way of being by turning the other cheek and not fighting back and willingly laying down his life so that even those who would take his could themselves find real life. And over the past few weeks specifically, we have been confronted with the brutality of a Roman crucifixion as Jesus was tortured for challenging the status quo before he ultimately gave up his life. And it just so happens that our regular weekly study that's been going on for over a year finds us this morning at the very point in the text that our calendars tell us to remember and celebrate today. The Easter text in Mark. And so with that said, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures or to follow along on the screens to Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 1, as we pick up where we left off last week. Mark 16, starting at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on in the first, the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And so just a few words of context to help us set the scene before we get to the parts uh, of the text that we really need to wrestle with today. So right off the top, our passage states that, that three women, two Marys and a Salome, purchased some spices so they could go anoint Jesus' body, which has, at this point, been taken down from the cross and placed within a tomb outside of Jerusalem belonging to a prominent member of the Jewish ruling council, council named Joseph of Arimathea. Now, this anointing was customary for first century Jews, not not as an embalming like the Egyptians did, but as a way to honor the dead and to cover up the stench as the body decayed in the tomb before the bones were placed in an ossuary or a bone box. You see, because Jesus was crucified, his friends and family had no opportunity to pay their proper respects, no proper funeral or procession. And so these women attempt to honor Jesus by going and anointing his body. Now the text tells us that this was a Saturday or the Sabbath. 
which means that the women waited until 6 o'clock p.m. when the Sabbath was over and the markets reopened to purchase the spices that they needed. And this was likely oil mixed with myrrh and some aloes. However, because it was too dark to go on Saturday night, they waited until early the following morning on Sunday to actually head to the tomb. Well, come Sunday morning, they set out to the tomb, and our text tells us that they have something on their mind. Right? There's a question that they ask as they head towards the tomb. Verse 3, they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? You see, every tomb had a large stone set in front of the entrance to keep the tomb sealed and to prevent animals and the like from getting at the body. And so as they were walking, the women wonder if there will be someone there to help them gain access to the body of Christ so they can perform the anointing. But it's through this question in the text that we realize an assumption that these women are making. You see, the women were fully expecting to find a tomb That was closed. The the question they pondered as they uh, went there wasn't, you know, what will we encounter when we get there? Or will the tomb be open? Will the body be there? No, because they made the reasonable assumption that when they got to the tomb, they would find the dead body of Jesus sealed inside. Now, why would they assume this? Because as we all know from experience and history, bodies that are dead stay dead. As I said before, the women made a reasonable assumption, which is the same assumption that many today make as well. Since we know that bodies don't rise, that dead things stay dead, many assume or conclude that Jesus didn't rise either. But the women's assumptions are challenged when they make it to the tomb. You see, what they thought they would see, what they took for granted that they would come across, wasn't what they found. Verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. All right, things were not as they expected. I can't imagine what was going through their minds at that moment. It obviously wasn't rational, because what do they do? They hurry right in. Right? I don't know about you, but if I'm in a cemetery, cemetery or a tomb site and a headstone has been dug up or a tomb unsealed, if I'm hurrying anywhere, it's away from there. Right? Anybody with me? But these women head straight in to see what was going on. And their experience, which was already unexpected, gets even wilder. Verse 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. They were alarmed translates literally into they were shook in today's vernacular, I think. And they should be. The tomb they expected to be sealed was open, and inside was not the lifeless body they expected, but was rather a man whom another gospel writer describes this way, Matthew 28, 3 to 4. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards posted by the tomb were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. This is pretty intense, isn't it? This is not simply a man. This fits the biblical description of an angel. An angel that has been sent by God to tell the women what was up. Well, the angel, seeing their fear, again, very reasonable, opens with the classic angelic introductory catchphrase, do not be afraid or don't be alarmed. Have you noticed that that every time angels appear in scripture, the first thing they need to say is do not be afraid? As an aside, can you imagine being so imposing a figure that you needed to begin every sentence with do not be afraid, I'm not going to hurt you? Right? Must be how Arnold Schwarzenegger feels or our very own Jeff Job. But I digress. What happens after this disclaimer is that the angel makes a declaration of what has happened. The the women's questions that they didn't even know they had on their way there were answered in three words. He has risen. Verse 6. Don't be alarmed. Do not be afraid, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here 
See the place where they laid him. Jesus is not here, the angel says. And he shows them the empty tomb. He says, take a look. See where the body should be? It isn't there. And here, friends, is where we all need to stop and ask ourselves what to make of this. What do we do with a historical document, the Bible, one of the most historically reliable documents of all time, actually, when it tells us that a man who was dead isn't dead anymore? Well, we can believe the words of the angel, we can trust the biblical account, or we can choose not to. But what we can't do is ignore this. Friends, what we decide about the truth of this statement here, he has risen, is the most important conclusion you will ever need to make. Because if you conclude that Jesus did not raise If you believe that this just is not true, then none of this is important. We as a church have wasted our time this year studying the life of a fraud. It means that that none of what Jesus did or said is reliable or authoritative. In fact, all of what he did and said is actually deceitful and harmful and is best to be avoided. Because he is not who he claimed to be and therefore didn't have the power to do any of what we've read about for the past 17 months, which means that we have all been fooled. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then he is simply another dead man, one of a hundred billion others throughout history who we would do well to forget. But on the other hand, if what the angel said is true, If Jesus is the one exception to the rule, if this is the ultimate proof that Mark's thesis about who Jesus is, then absolutely everything changes. What we know about the world changes. What we give our lives to do should be radically altered by the words we just read. He is not here. He has risen. And so because this question is so critical, is so important, because everything hinges on the validity of this statement, it's essential for us to spend some time asking this morning, what do we do with an empty tomb? Right? What are the possibilities that we have when it comes to the fact that Jesus' body was not in the tomb that day, and by extension, the fact that Jesus' body has never been found to this day? Well, there have essentially been four alternatives presented over the years, four possible landing places, four theories, one of which we must accept as an explanation for the tomb being empty that day. And this morning, we're going to walk through them to see if any are satisfactory answers to this all-important question. So the first suggestion as to why the tomb was empty, the first alternative for us is that Jesus didn't actually die. Jesus didn't actually die. The theory here is that the soldiers took Jesus down from the cross prematurely, thinking he was dead when he was in fact not dead. And so when Jesus eventually came to, he got up, dusted himself off, and left the tomb eventually appearing to the disciples who thought he had risen from the dead when he had never actually been dead. And this is the answer uh, most commonly given today by Muslims and by many atheists as to why the tomb was empty. But unfortunately for them, this proposal doesn't stand up very well under scrutiny and has been rejected by nearly all historians and scholars. Listen to how two uh, prominent atheist historians respond to this theory. John Dominic Crossan says, That Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. Or Gerd Ludemann says, The fact of the death of Jesus as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Despite hypotheses of pseudo-death or a deception which are sometimes put forward, it need not be discussed further here. Right? Even those atheist scholars who, who are looking to discredit the resurrection of Jesus cannot affirm this theory as legitimate. And, and this is in large part because if we know anything about the Romans historically, is that they know how to kill someone, right? 
Roman centurions were trained executioners, sometimes crucifying up to 6,000 people in a day, according to the first century historian Josephus. They did not pull people down from the cross prematurely. And, and even if they were fooled by the eye test, they ensured fatality either by breaking the legs of the one on the cross to expedite asphyxiation, or as they did with Jesus after he already died, thrust a spear through his side, John 19, 34, puncturing vital organs in the process to seal the deal. Jesus died on the cross, plain and simple. Now, even on the absurd chance that Jesus was still somehow alive coming off the cross, which he wasn't, he would have at last died in the tomb where he was laid from loss of blood, shock, infection, dehydration, organ failure, you name it. He certainly wouldn't have been walking around within three days appearing to over 500 people with not a recorded scratch on him, aside from the holes in his hands. And so, upon closer inspection, the, the Jesus didn't actually die theory is not a legitimate explanation for an empty tomb. Well, if that is off the table, and we assume that Jesus did in fact die, there are three additional explanations left. One of them is more sinister than the others. And that is the theory that the disciples took the body. Right? The disciples took the body. So this theory goes that, that Jesus did, in fact, die. And the disciples knew that he died, but they stole the body, discarded it somewhere where it has never been found, and then told the tale that he has risen from the dead. So it, it was the disciples that made up the resurrection, and, and they disposed of the evidence that would prove their theory wrong. And this, this theory of an elaborate hoax by the disciples was first proposed by Jewish leaders almost immediately after word got out that the body was missing. Listen to Matthew's account of the aftermath. Matthew 28. After the women left, so this is right after this, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. All right, so this theory is very old and has been held on to by some for a long time. However, while it looks like a reasonable explanation at first thought, it, it begins to break down in light of what happens next. You see, over the next 60 years or so, we know from historical records that these very same disciples who were accused of faking Jesus' resurrection would all face severe persecution and most would eventually die for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Which leads us to an important question. Who dies for something they know to be untrue? Who, for 20 or 30, even 60 years, doubles down on what they know to be false, giving their lives for an elaborate hoax that gains them nothing in terms of money, power, or anything else? And beyond that, along the way, all the way to their gruesome deaths, not one of them admits to this or even changes the story even slightly. Not one of them tries to save their own skin or retract even parts of their story. In the words of Christian minister Chuck Colson, 12 powerless men, peasants really, were facing not just embarrassment or political disgrace, but beatings, stonings, execution. Every single one of Jesus' disciples insisted to their dying breath that they had physically seen Jesus bodily raised from the dead. Don't you think that one of those apostles would have cracked before being beheaded or stoned? That one of them would have made a deal with the authorities? None did. What's interesting about this quote from Chuck Colson is that he was himself a part of the Nixon administration and was jailed for being a part of a U.S. governmental conspiracy known as Watergate. And he points out that, almost, that under almost no pressure comparatively, 
members of Nixon's administration, his uh, co-workers, couldn't keep their cover-up going for longer than two weeks before everyone started caving. Right? Intensely loyal civil servants selling each other out within weeks under the threat of mere political embarrassment, let alone bringing a lie perpetuated for decades to their graves. People just don't endure torture and martyrdom for what they know to be false. The disciples couldn't have just made this up. And this doesn't even account for the embarrassment criterion. The, the accounts that they all told, independently of one another and, and amazingly consistent, that they went out of their way, traveling throughout the Roman Empire to tell, do not paint themselves in a good light at all. Peter, their leader, is painted as one who denied Jesus. Thomas is presented as one who doubted Jesus. The rest are presented as, dis, as dis, deserters and cowards who only responded after women of all people verified the empty tomb. Which, as an aside, if you're creating a narrative from scratch to be taken seriously, you would not trace the narrative back to the testimony of women whose witness was regarded as invalid in first century culture. That is, unless you are telling the truth. As Pastor Chris Price asserts, as an author, trying to commend to your audience the legitimacy of your new religious movement, you don't include these embarrassing details about your leaders unless you are remarkably committed to authenticity and telling the truth about what happened warts and all. Historians would call this the embarrassment criterion, which is used to evaluate the reliability of a historical source. Simply stated, when a writer records information that is potentially embarrassing to his or her, her, his or her, his or her own interests, it is likely that the information is credible and accurate rather than the imaginative creation of the author for polemical purposes. Right? When you look at the movement that the disciples led, which gained them nothing personally, made them look bad, as well as the ultimate cost that they each paid to perpetuate it, it is just impossible to conclude that they made this up. Which means that we need to look for another alternative. And one presented is that they went to the wrong tomb. Right? That's the other suggestion. They went to the wrong tomb. The theory goes like this. Jesus did die, he was buried, and they did find the tomb empty that day, because they were at the wrong one. And as a result, the disciples were convinced of and gave their lives for a resurrection that never actually happened. Now, this explanation, in my mind, makes more sense than the first two in light of history. However, it fails to hold up to any sort of scrutiny as well. You see, first of all, from a biblical perspective, we know that the women who came to the tomb that Sunday morning had seen Jesus laid in the tomb. If we go back just a few verses to Mark 15, 46 and 47, we read this. So Joseph of Arimathea brought some linen cloth, took the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Right? These women were not following someone's, you know, link to a Google map. They were not counting paces to get to where they thought he might be. They were returning to a place that they had been before. And so it is highly doubtful that they went to a different tomb. Now, there's an even better argument. Secondly, if this was true, that, that they had simply just gone to the wrong tomb that day, then the Jewish leaders could have easily proven the resurrection of Jesus wrong simply by producing the body. Right, going to the, the right tomb, which was owned by a well-to-do and well-known religious leader, would have been an easy task and an easy way to squash the Jesus movement before it began, which was something they could and did not do. And to this day, it is something that no one has been able to do. Despite thousands of attempts to dig up old ossuaries in Israel and Palestine, raiding tombs to try and find the body of Jesus, 2,000 years and not one match. Perhaps the reason the Jewish leaders couldn't produce the body 
and no one has produced it since, is that there was no body in the right tomb where Jesus was laid. Which leads us to the final option that we have when it comes to the empty tomb. We can believe the words of the angel that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And as crazy as it seems at first, to believe that one man didn't follow the natural order of things, it is actually the most reasonable response to the proof. J. Warner Wallace, a cold case homicide detective who became a Christian at the age of 35 after using his unique skill set to investigate the claims of the New Testament rites. The last explanation, although it is a miraculous supernatural explanation, suffers from the least number of liabilities and deficiencies. If we simply enter into the investigation without a pre-existing bias against anything supernatural, the final explanation accounts for all of the evidence without any difficulty. The final explanation accounts for the evidence most simply and most exhaustively, and it is logically consistent. The final explanation is superior to all other accounts. You see, Wallace states that if we can conclude that God was involved and the biblical account is true, the resurrection of Jesus becomes not only the most acceptable explanation, but becomes a foolproof explanation for the evidence that we have sociologically, historically, and philosophically. The only obstacle is to concede that something out of the ordinary happened. That the God of the universe did something that doesn't happen every day. Which, friends, I contend is precisely why we are still talking about this event 2,000 years later and nearly 10,000 kilometers away. While the Christian explanation does involve faith, that God did something miraculous, it involves just as much faith to believe in any of the other possibilities. And it is not naive to conclude that the resurrection is the best explanation for an empty tomb. The best explanation for how 12 men who had previously been dejected and fearful went from dissolution cowards to bold martyrs is that they had encountered the risen Jesus. The best explanation for how this movement of poor Jewish peasants whose leader was killed would grow rather than being snuffed out as all other movements had, eventually becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire, is that Jesus actually rose from the dead. The best explanation for how hundreds of people claimed to see the risen Jesus and invited others to verify their accounts with contemporaries who could verify it is that they, Jesus actually rose from the dead. The best explanation for Jesus' very own brother, James, who absolutely did not believe that his brother was anything special before his death, becoming a Christian leader in the church and a martyr for his declaration that Jesus was God afterwards, is that he encountered the risen Jesus, as the scriptures say he did. As an aside, let me ask you, what would it take for you to declare your sibling to be God and then die for that belief? Think about what your sibling has done throughout the years. It would take something pretty extravagant, something miraculous, right? And this list of best explanations could go on. But if we can simply take one step of faith, one step of educated faith, reasonable faith, and acknowledge that while well, dead people do stay dead, we're not abandoning that. There is one in history who by the power of God came alive again, then not only do we have a reasonable explanation to believe, we have an incredible hope for which to live. And that is what this is really about, isn't it? Remember early on, we said that if this isn't true, we should just walk away, and if it is true, then it changes everything? Well, if it is true, as the evidence suggests that Jesus has come back to life, that he rose from the dead, that death wasn't the end for him, it means that death doesn't need to be the end for us either. Did you hear that? 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does first fruits mean? Well, it means that there are more to come. There will be second fruits. That, that just as Jesus has been raised to, was raised to life after he died, <clears throat> we too 
can be raised to eternal life after we have died. Listen to the promise of 2 Corinthians 4.14. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Or as Jesus himself says in John 11.25-26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. For those who are in Christ, for those who believe in his name, who confess that he is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, when they die, they simply pass from life to life. From earthly life to eternal life. Eternal means that it does not stop. There is no pause. There is no gap. And Jesus says, because of what he has done, we can live even though we die. That is what the tomb declares to us. And church, this truth should change absolutely everything. For those who struggle with fear, what do we have to fear if even death is not permanent? For those who are in pain, there is hope for the day when pain will be no more. For those who are mourning the loss of a loved one in Christ, mourn no longer because they are not dead. They are simply living in a way they never have before. For those who are stressed and anxious, lay your burdens down because if Christ can lead us out of death, he can lead us out of any and every trial. For those who are struggling to find identity and purpose, The empty tomb gives us a life worth living as we pass from this life to the next. Listen to what the angel concludes as he sends the women away from the tomb. Verse 7. Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. First of all, at the end, the angel reminds them that they shouldn't have ever been shocked to find an empty tomb. This is literally what Jesus said would happen all along, right? Just as he told you, saying in Mark 8, 31, after three days I will rise again. In Mark 9, 31, after three days I will rise. In Mark 10, 33 to 34, three days later I will rise. How did you miss that, the angel says. While this all seems so crazy to Mary and, Mary and Salome, it was precisely what Jesus had been preparing them for. It was precisely what God had planned from the beginning. But the other thing that the angel did, and we'll end with this, was that he sent them out on mission. Did you catch that? He sent them out with the message of the empty tomb. He gave them a purpose. Go, tell the others, the angel said. Tell the others what you have seen, what you have encountered at the empty tomb. And friends, the commission for us is the same. We have been given this purpose as well. For those of us who have pondered the tomb and concluded that it is empty because Jesus has risen, our mission is to go and tell the others. Right? This news is too amazing to keep to ourselves. You see, a life that truly understands the significance of the empty tomb is a life that shares the significance of the empty tomb. So may we, church, not just nod along, but may we go with the incredibly good, life-changing news that he has risen. Do you pray with me? God, we thank you for truth. God, we thank you for what you have done. And God, I pray that you would give us minds that make room for God, minds that make room for you, and that when we see you working, Lord, the only thing we can conclude is that he is risen. And Father, we pray that that truth wouldn't just change our lives, but it would change the lives of everyone around us as we go and share that incredible, life-changing news. Amen. Now, as we wrap up this morning, uh, and as we prepare to celebrate the truth of a risen Savior and go out from here on mission, I do want to offer a few resources for those who may be pondering this stuff for the first time or would like to engage in more of these types of conversations. Uh, First of all, we have a free book at our Welcome Center written by uh, Pastor Chris Price called Radical Hope which addresses precisely what we've been discussing this morning, just in a little bit more detail. So swing by the Welcome Center in the foyer, and we would love to give you a free copy of that book. 
And for those who would like to dialogue with others about this or other aspects of the Christian faith, we have a class coming up called Christianity Explored, where we talk through the basics of Christianity in the context of community. And uh, I believe there is a table that will be set up in the foyer where you can find more details uh, about Christianity Explored and how you can be a part of that before you head home. But for now, let us thank God together that because he lives, we have a life worth living. Would you please stand?
it's because you live that everything is different. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are here alive today. Thank you that you are hearing us worship and hearing us pray. And thank you that everything is different, that we can face tomorrow, that fear doesn't have the grip on us anymore. And God, would you continue to take hold of our hearts, to empower us to where you are sending us this week and beyond. Oh, Father, we want to walk in faithfulness behind you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can take a seat. My name's Steve. I'm one of the pastors here, and what a powerful Sunday we've had here together. And if God is doing something in your heart, what I mean by that is if you're resonating with what's been said or it's gripping your heart in a new way and you want to talk with someone, there's a few of us that will be by the front of the stage here and would love to pray with you. If it's your first time here with us today or our first time in a while, I encourage you to come up and say hi and be sure to stop by the Welcome Center in the foyer by the tree and there we have a special gift for our guests. I have two events that I'd like to make you aware of, some different opportunities that we have as a church community to gather, grow, and go. One of those is a conference that's coming up and starting on April 18th. It's a conference that happens uh, in the evening uh, once a week for several weeks in a row, and it's called Hope for the Journey Conference. And it's for those who are impacted by the foster care or adoption topics in their lives. We have many within our church congregation that are either navigating the road of adoption or navigating foster care. And so this is an opportunity to be equipped in that, even if you're just interested about foster adoption and wondering how you can support maybe loved ones who are navigating that journey. Journey. Come out to this conference, and there you can be equipped and encouraged. Friday, April 21st, is our third prayer summit this year, and I encourage all of you to mark that date on your calendar and come join with us in prayer as we intercede as a community for where God is leading us. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity to seek God together and encourage you strongly to come. And now, my friends, this is a moment that I've been waiting for for several months. It's my honor that on this Easter Sunday, I get to reveal a very special announcement to this church community. And announcements like these don't happen very often, and I'm confident that every one of you will be impacted by this. So please attention, turn your attention to the screens. This is going to be epic. Bereshit bara Elohim. Friends, May 7th, you can all look forward to our next sermon series in the book of Genesis. And if you thought the Gospel of Mark went long, my friends, buckle up. Yeah. I am thrilled for this series. There is so much in the book of Genesis that is so foundational to our faith. Along the book of Genesis asks so many good questions, and we're going to be unpacking that in very real ways. So I look forward to that. I do want to remind you that our cafe is closed today, but there is free pancakes. I can see that they're already given her out there, and so we will dismiss you to that. I encourage you to stick around for it. My friends, this is where we will close for today. We're a church that desires to walk in obedience to Jesus in all things as we gather, grow, and go to the glory of God. Take care.
Might by 11? <laughs> With these songs? Well, we got tracks, right? We have tracks. The drums are in all the tracks. True, true. The Lord provides people.
Ústecký kraj.